Great. Well, I'm just going to get started. Okay. Um, everybody, thank you for your patience while we get this room sorted out. This is um, not our normal space, so I appreciate the help from the IT and I appreciate your patience as we get started. Um, folks online, when I sit down, I'll try to monitor the chat for you, but we can hear you when you speak in the room. So my name is Martha Sullivan. I'm the chair of industrial design and our three programs in the new school of design along with interior design and Brad Whitney is back there. If you would raise your hand. But, um, and then Terry Clements is in a um, conference out in California. So Sally, she's not able to be here with us today, but the three of us got together and um, we're reviewing a strategic meeting that our groups had as the School of Design formed this summer, and health and wellness um, came to the forefront of the topics that we were concerned with. I feel like each one of our programs addresses health and wellness in a variety of ways and certainly across scales. Um, it's also something that binds us to the university. I would say health and wellness is um, a critical component of multiple constituents on campus not just including the medical school. Um, I know many of you students have worked on health and wellness. I know there's many of us across all the programs maybe working on senior living right now and other areas. Um, and so what we thought would be helpful is to really kick off our school of design with one of the topics that binds us together. So today each one of our um, Programs has invited a guest um, who's a specialist in, a, in, in the area of health and wellness. And so we're really excited to look at landscape, interior architecture, and then also the scale of the human through industrial design and biomedical engineering. So the format of today is each of the presenters will present for approximately um, like 10 minutes or something. And then at the end of the program, we'll get all three of the panelists together and have a group discussion in which I hope the students and faculty will ask questions about what they've seen and then also really think about the future of design because the hope at, at this university is to launch you into the creative fields and not just get you that first job, but how do you stay creative and engaged with uh, a society and a culture that really needs smart design right now? And so I hope that this is inspirational to you as it is to me. And I'll um, maybe introduce our, our first um, speaker, Naomi Sachs, is a, a professor at the University of Maryland. And right now she's speaking to us from Maryland. Um, and so she's gonna share her screen and we'll hear her over the speakers in the room. All right, uh, thanks so much. And uh, Naomi, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll give you uh, the chance to share your screen. Great, thank you. Okay. That looks like it's working. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. I'll turn down this Go for it, Naomi. All right, great. Um, well, first, thank you, uh, Caitlin Adams, for inviting me to come and for um, Terry Clements for being a gracious host. I know she's at the American Society of Landscape Architects Conference. Um, and Martha Sullivan for uh, also being a gracious host. And I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, I was very excited about it, but my dogs had other plans for me, speaking of health and wellness. Um, so, I'm going to dive in to my talk, which is titled Landscapes for Health and Wellness, Current and Future Practices and Trends. So what I do in my research and education um, and advocacy and design is working for access to nature, um, or what I call landscapes for health, both in healthcare and beyond in many situations. Um, I focused on healthcare for a long time, but it started kind of branching out recently. Well, yeah, somewhat recently. Um, so why healthcare? Because a lot of healthcare facilities still look like this. This was taken not that long ago, pre-COVID, but not that long ago, when they could look like this. Um, so here's a great example of interior design and landscape architect architecture working together. 
Too many healthcare gardens still look like this. This was actually in San Francisco. Um, when they could look like this, which is a new design in um, Boston at the Boston Children's Rooftop Healing Garden. And for me, um, a lot of you are students, and so you may have had your light bulb moment about why you want to study what you're studying, um, or maybe you're waiting for that light bulb to go off. For me, it was when I was in between undergrad, having gotten a, max, a bachelor's in women's studies and my graduate, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and I saw an article, or actually a whole issue of Landscape Architecture Magazine on healing gardens. And I just thought, wow, I could be creative and yet do something that I would be interested in and that would make a difference and help people um, and maybe earn a living. Um, that would be nice. So that's how I started and decided to go to UC Berkeley um, because they had a, a really good program in um, kind of landscapes for health at that time. Um, and shortly after I graduated, I founded the Therapeutic Landscapes Network, which is a nonprofit um, that connects people with information and people <coughs> and nature. It's sort of a, a clearinghouse for information and research about landscapes for health. So what is a landscape for health? I always like to start, can you see my cursor by the way? Yes. Okay, great. So I like to start with the World Health Organization's definition of health, which I really like because it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So health, according to the WHO, is not just not being sick. It's really a much more holistic definition. And so a landscape for health or a restorative landscape in my definition, is any landscape that promotes human health and well-being. It can be as small as a rooftop or even a, a fire escape. It can be as large as a national park. Um, it can be indoors or outdoors. It can be in a prison. It can be on the National Mall. Lots of scales and types of landscapes for health. And then I define a healing garden or a therapeutic garden as a garden that's designed for a specific population with a specific intended outcome, um, hopefully informed by research. So the one on the right was designed for children um, at a pediatric facility in Oregon. Uh, I'm sorry, the one on the top left and the one on the right was designed for people with AIDS in New York City. Um, so, and then a rehabilitation garden is designed with specific physical, occupational, speech, et cetera, therapists for a specific population and or therapeutic modality. So the one on the bottom left is a burn center garden, um, again in Portland, Oregon, and the one on the bottom right is a sensory garden for um, young adults and children with autism on the autism spectrum. And any of you who have looked into um, the importance or the, the, the research on access to nature um, and health, you will find that there's very, very strong evidence now that connection with nature reduces stress and depression and aggression and violence and all sorts of other bad things and it improves mood and well-being and even immune function, um, cognition, which you, know, you probably have to know a lot about if you're a student, um, creativity, longevity, and it also promotes these other good things like exercise, and altruism, environmental stewardship. So access to nature and connection with nature are really important. Um, oh my gosh, almost 10 years ago, I wrote this book with Claire Cooper Marcus, who's one of my wonderful mentors. Um, and that book, the, the, I guess the guidelines that went into that book um, then became my dissertation. Um, when I went to Texas A&M University to study, to get my PhD in architecture. And the reason that I chose this as my PhD topic is that healing gardens were becoming more widely used, um, which is great, but many of the healthcare healing gardens looked like this, um, which was not, <laughs> according to you know our design guidelines and all of the research, they really weren't cutting it in terms of best practices for what would promote health and wellness of both patients and visitors and staff. 
Um, so I devised and tested the Healthcare Garden Evaluation Toolkit, which is used um, for evaluation of existing healthcare gardens. It can be used as a design and teaching tools, teaching tool um, for guidelines and benchmarks, and perhaps even for certification down the road, and also for research, for people to um, kind of have baseline research. And it's starting to be used by lots of different people, including designers and healthcare folks um, and researchers and students. Um, the HGET is a set of four tools. Um, the one is a, a kind of objective evaluation tool. One is a survey, whoops, survey, um, a behavior mapping or observation tool, and then stakeholder interviews. So I've been asked a lot, could the HGET work outside of healthcare? Um, this is a parking lot in, at the San Diego Hospice. Um, here's a parking lot somewhere in the middle of everyday USA. Um, and you know, if we did the H get at this parking lot, it would probably get, or the, the audit, um, it would probably get a very low score. And so that's something that I'm interested in, is re-examining the healthcare garden evaluation toolkit for public, general public spaces. I was interested in healthcare gardens because they serve people when they're at their most vulnerable. Um, and I figured, well, it's really serving everyone because everyone probably is going to encounter a healthcare facility at one point in their lives, either as a patient and or as a loved one or a visitor or as a, a care member, like a nurse or a doctor. Recently though, um, well, I guess over the past five or 10 years, I've been thinking, why do we need to wait until people need a hospital? <laughs> so this is the kind of design about this is salutogenic design or design for health, um, which was coined by Anton Antonovsky in 1979. So this idea of health promotion, um, and here there's a picture of stairs, rather than taking the elevator, you take the stairs and there's lots of plant material, there's lots of natural light, there's a little gathering space for people. So this is a great example of indoor <coughs> salutogenic design. Um, and kind of with that in mind, when I was a postdoc at Cornell, I worked with Mardell Shepley on a systematic literature review of the impact of urban green space on the potential frequency of violent crime incidents. Um, and this was a, a very rigorous review of um, hundreds of studies. And we published um, this back in the Environmental Research and Public Health. And actually, Reimagining the Civic Commons just returned to that research and did a nice interview with me and Mardell. Um, a subsequent paper by the same team we just published an article about the kind of cost benefit evaluation of vacant lot remediation and firearm violence. So looking um, not just at healthcare facilities, but lots of other um, types of, of places. Because as we know, not all outdoor spaces are created equal. Um, people, we, this really came to the fore during the pandemic when people wanted to go outside, which was wonderful, but people had the ability and were seeking the outdoors, um, but it really became apparent that some facilities, I'm sorry, that some public spaces were really good, and some, mostly in disadvantaged communities, were far worse and really needed a lot of help. Another study um, related to COVID that I was involved in, and this is Rachel Goldstein on the left with her kids, was a study about the use of access to nature and gardening during the early COVID pandemic. Um, and yes, we did find <laughs> that anxiety was reduced and that people did garden more and get out into nature more during that time. Um, more recently, I wrote a chapter with Jenny Rowe, who's at Virginia School, uh, University of Virginia, on the urban nature happiness hypothesis. So this is a whole book on infrastructure, well-being, and the measurement of happiness from some really amazing authors, and it was a thrill to be part of that book. And Jenny 
and I, um, I really enjoyed looking at connection with nature as a way to create joy and happiness and how that is a way to benefit people and foster human health and well-being. So rather than just looking at things, um, uh, you know, nature as it decreases stress, how does nature promote joy? A couple other research things that I've been involved with, um, the what I call design empathy equipment. I was able to get some of the this equipment through my department, the Plant Science and Landscape Architecture grant. And I use this design empathy equipment with my students. Um, this is the GERT suit, the age simulation, gerontological simulator GERT suit. And that's me on the right wearing the GERT suit. I actually hurt my back because it's about, weighs about 50 pounds. And uh, I wore it for a little bit too long and walked a little bit too far. Um, but here are my students wearing it. We had an exercise where they walked from our building to another building across the street and had to navigate um, this paving surface, which doesn't seem all that bumpy until you ride it in a wheelchair. Uh, and um, we also take this equipment out to sites um, where people have to ride and walk and roll a, a, a walker on pea gravel and mulch and lawn and really get a sense of how difficult it is to use this equipment and to be um, differently abled uh, on anything but a linoleum floor indoors. So I'll be exploring, oops, that's a typo, uh, some research questions about does the use of this equipment have any lasting design changes in thinking and design thinking? Does or can it increase empathy for other situations where you can't physically embody the exercise? So for example, mental health or autism, spectrum disorder, or even situations like racism and sexism and homophobia. I love teaching, um, partly because I get to explore other aspects of health that I just don't have the time or the funding to do on my own. So for many projects in studio, we explore all different aspects of health and wellness, including climate change and stormwater management, and um, equity issues and health and wellness exercise. Um, so here's one studio where we took over a parking lot uh, on campus and turned it into a health park. Oh, actually, no, this was, yeah, this is a CVS um, parking lot that we took over and made a park for health. And here's the um, University of Maryland parking lot that we took over. Unfortunately, not in real life, <laughs> but um, you always hope that your designs, if you show them to the right people, can inspire others. So my takeaways for you um, is that this is a really exciting time for designers with the infrastructure bill uh, and so on. This is a time where we as designers can be the, the superheroes of the future. Um, you have to choose Carefully, you have to have an intention to use your superpowers with empathy, passion, curiosity, joy, and even love. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi, we really appreciate that. And I'm gonna invite up our next speaker, um, Kim Lombard. Let me just get back to your presentation. No words, I felt really good about those. Yeah. I'm glad that. I can move this, um, so I have to share my screen to make that happen. Exciting. This guy, share, and slideshow. Switched. There we go. Oh, it was doing it, I think. The there we go. The slides are, okay. if you forward oh. to right oh, there. there we go. Okay. Um, 
Ms. Kim Lamard is an architect and a senior sustainability leader with AECOM. She was recognized by her peers and elevated to uh, lead fellow by the U.S. Green Building Council in 2019. Her projects involve a wide spectrum of building types to include higher education, federal, and health care. Her most recent LEED certified in certifications include the Eisenhower Memorial, NASA's Measurement and Sciences Laboratory at the Langley Research Center, and the Franklin Medical, Biomedical Research Center on the Virginia Tech Carilion campus. She works with project teams to achieve sustainability and wellness goals within the built environment. Thank so you. Welcome, Ken. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm so happy to see this many folks on a Friday afternoon, <laughs> on a rainy Friday afternoon. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be here uh, and wonderful to speak to these groups. So as you heard from the intro, I'm an architect by trade. I, I specialize in LEED uh, certifications for our clients, but also in well and fit well. And that's uh, really interesting because it, it does merge. And Naomi, your, your presentation is going to dovetail beautifully with what I've got here. So that's, that's great. All right. So I've, I've got our wonderful chameleon up here talking about you can't change what you don't measure. It's as a, you'll hear this a million times in your career, but it's so true. If you don't measure it, if you don't know where you're starting, you don't know where you're going. So that's what I do a lot is the measurement. Do I just? Yeah, if you hit the error button. Okay. Hey. <laughs> so the two programs that I use the most are going to be Well and Fit Well. And I'll talk just very briefly about these. Um, you, you know, in the working world, you're going to have these. Our clients uh, want to put these plaques on their building. Uh, all the buildings that you build here are LEED certified, but some of them are going to start being well certified. You'll see that. Well is um, probably the most known, but it also is, is very technical and it's um, a little on the high end is what I would say. Uh, it's got a lot of um, after occupancy reporting that clients sometimes will do, but sometimes they won't. So fit well, the one I lean toward just a little bit more, is a little more um, digestible. Uh, it's a little more, uh, you're able to get your arms around it. Both systems will, um, and I'm I probably need to back up just a little bit, but both systems are considered third-party rating systems. So when we build buildings or um, you know we have interiors going on, we'll have um, we'll have a, a group or a set of documentation that we deliver to either well or fit well, and then they will they will say yes you achieved this or no you didn't achieve this try again. So that's a third party, someone that's not involved in the project. Um, each one of these works around the seven principles of a well building or a wellness building. Um, that would be the air, the light, the water, also uh, your nutrition, your food, and then your um, exercise, also comfort and mental is <laughs> the one I always forget, is <laughs> the mind. So, you know, I'm happy to talk in depth on any of those. I think that would get us just a little longer than we need to be here today, so we'll, I'll, I'll go past those, but just know there are those seven principles that will come around every time in all of your disciplines. So that's just their, their tagline, FitWell. So we'll go past that. Um, in FitWell, these are their categories that they always work toward. I'm not going to belabor these, but just know, you, you can see that some of these are purely architecture, but some of them will go into landscape architecture, someone will go into uh, industrial design and then interior. Now, I said, I heard interior design and interior architecture. Is there a, are we uh, leaning on one or the other terminology? We're at equal opportunity. Because <laughs> you, hear, you hear it both ways out in the working world, so I'm always, I'm always interested to see which way that goes. As Naomi mentioned briefly, stairs. You have a wonderful set of, or, or wonderful piece of exercise equipment in almost every building, that's more than one story, uh, you're using the stairs. But this isn't just for architects. This is also for, you want to engage those stairs. You want to make those stairs, and now I need to add to this list, thanks Naomi, is plants. <laughs> so you always want to try to get your, your uh, participants to use the stairs. In architecture, we do that by placing the stairs before the elevator. You want to have them have to trip over the stairs before they get to the elevator 
Sometimes that isn't possible. You want to make that stair either monumental or inviting in some way, engaging with the, with the user. Art, music, lighting, plants. <laughs> um, workspaces, we've all seen these sit-to-stand desk. You know, workplaces have evolved over pandemic so much. Uh, sitting, and I know we, we do this out here a lot in studio, it, you, we've all got to get up and move. And we're being reminded all the time to get up and move. <laughs> but the sit-to-stand desk in the working environment is definitely very popular. And you'll see that a, a, quite a bit. Also, the not so popular, but I think it's still, it's still got a ways to go, is the working tread or the, what, the treadmill desk. Um, you know, obviously not all tasks can be accomplished this way, but we'll get, you know, if you want to check your email or you have a community treadmill desk, it's, it's kind of comical, but it works. And then the last one that really got me was this guy. And I, this is a total pandemic, and sorry for the poor quality on the photo, but a uh, total pandemic uh, a hack job there where he has, I don't know that I would like to sit on a bicycle seat for eight hours a day, but um, I, I hope he's got another chair in there. <laughs> Signage is something, and this, you know, for the interior designers in the, in the room, this is something you're going to run across quite a bit. Um, when those stairs can't fall before the elevator, we try to, eh, not guilt people, I would say guilt, I would say, you know, encourage people to, to use the stairs. Hey, go burn some calories, use the stairs. Um, that's always a good thing. We see hand washing. I, you know, checked out your restaurant before here, and you do have great hand washing signs signs in here. Not just all employees must wash their hands before they return to work. You have a whole description of how you wash your hands. Surprisingly, it's important. <laughs> I think we've learned that in the last few years. And then um, the no smoking. That's pretty, pretty common now. No smoking around the building. So. Um, food and water. This is a real, an interesting subject. Um, and it's, it's interesting that Well and Fitwell both address this. Um, you've got it addressed in, in many different ways. Um, are we looking for these healthy vending machines? How do we get the farmer's freshness to a vending machine? You know, other, other cultures, other um, countries use the vending machine almost ubiquitous, ubiquitously, but we're, we're not fully utilizing them yet. I can buy a salad at my, at my office building from the vending machine, and it's relatively fresh, but it's probably not my first choice. So we've got a little ways to go there to figure out how to get that farmer freshness into one of these. Um, also, of course, the bottle fillers, that's something that all those uh, systems will address where you have, um, uh, you want to have filtered water available for every, every worker, every, everyone that's an occupant in your building. Seems like a pretty straightforward thing because we have codes in the U.S. that require to have, uh, you know, water. Not everywhere has that, so that's a, an interesting one. Um, and the point of sale. This is what I want to talk just a little bit about. So um, I think it's uh, Dietz. Is it Dietz? Is the late night go grab a pizza or whatever place? So look next time you go through there at the at your as you leave, as you're in that last 10, 20 seconds of checking out. Look at all the high caloric and very unhealthy foods that are going to be right there at the cash register. And that's everywhere. It's sheets. Everybody does it. If we could just substitute some of that and have some apples, some fresh vegetables, some rice cakes, whatever, <laughs> it, would, it would go a long way toward health, I think, especially in those late night, uh, those late night evenings, you know. <laughs> and then future. And we'll talk a lot more about this, I think, as we move on. But I think, personally, what I see in the future is connectivity. Um, you know, we're all connected. I don't know how many of you are aware of you. You're young. Don't. Time size is important. But, <laughs> you, know, you know, I know how many steps I have. And my Google talks to me. My lights are connected. My garage door is connected. It's all connected. And I think we're just going to go more. And I think it's going to be more into the health, the health side of things. And you're going to know when you're feeling a little blue. Maybe your artwork changes or your room color changes. There's going to be that type of, I think, connectivity moving forward. And I think, you know, it's exciting to see that you're going to think about that. You are going to solve these issues and you're going to make these things, make these things happen. So that's really all I have to say today, but I'm happy to answer any kind of questions. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Yeah, we will definitely have time for questions awesome. um, coming up in just a second. I'm going to get back to Andy's slide here for a minute. You can yeah, go ahead and get ready to, yeah, I'm just going to do your intro and then you're okay. good to go. Um, Dr. Andy Moliner practiced pediatric medicine for 40 years, 32 as a pediatric pulmonologist with his last 20 in Southwest Virginia. He has worked on transdisciplinary research and development teams with a focus on medical devices, um, patient access, and global health. He served as president, CEO, and chief medical officer for an international healthcare NGO, City Hope Relief and Development, a nonprofit pediatric medical device institute, and a telemedicine practice, Triangle Apina Consultants. He is co-founder of Virginia Tech's Team Malawi, Technology, Education, Advocacy, and Medicine. Dr. Mulinaire is a professor of practice in biomedical engineering and a professor of pediatrics at the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine at Virginia Tech. He also happens to be a hokey dad. His daughter, Caroline Mulinaire, graduated from the industrial design program in 2016. Yeah, a, Some, yeah maybe a little earlier than that. Uh, maybe 2013. We def I def both Bill and I definitely had her as a student. So we welcome very much Dr. Moulinier and um, thank you for being with us. I'm going to stop sharing and he's going to share his screen too. Okay, go for it. I think I can do this. Okay, while well, I'm screen sharing, show of hands, who has had their flu vaccine? That's pretty impressive. <laughs> You know, it's everywhere. I had mine about six weeks ago, and about two weeks ago, I started getting the sniffles on a Sunday morning and um, went, whoa, I must be getting COVID, and did the, the nasal swab, and it was negative, and I called my primary care, and Ross, and I said, Ross, I think I have the flu. Give me the Tamiflu. And then he made me go get a test. I had influenza A, despite having had the vaccine. Symptoms started Sunday morning. By Tuesday evening, I was asymptomatic and feeling great. So these vaccines don't guarantee that you're not going to get it, but they can attenuate your response. And for older folks like me, it could be the difference between having a cold for three days and being in the ICU. So. Uh, get your flu vaccines, protect yourself, protect your parents and grandparents. You know, we're heading home for Thanksgiving here shortly. So uh, let me get this going here now. All right. There we go. Okay, let me get here. Always have trouble. All right. Let's do it the other way then. One more click of the button so I can see my slides. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the uh, kind of the general uh, title of this was uh, the future of wellness and the impact of design on human health. And I want to talk today a little bit about um, access to care everywhere. Right here in Southwest Virginia, access to health care is, is a challenge. Then uh, we uh, move on to Sub-Saharan Africa, where it uh, is even more challenging. Um, try accessing healthcare in the middle of nowhere, Saudi Arabia. A um, little bit closer to home, um, working in Haiti. And even here in the US, the Navajo Nation is a great example of where access to healthcare is a huge challenge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about telemedicine today. I have three uh, kind of general interests. I had to do a bio for another uh, conference I'm doing next week. And I listed my interests as being uh, medical devices, global health, and telemedicine. I've done a lot of work in telemedicine at Carilion Clinic. I've done some projects with uh, industrial design and biomedical engineering here. Uh, practice telemedicine uh, in the military and um, at Carilion Clinic. So uh, we really are looking to uh, reach out to the underserved 
Um, you see telemedicine, you know, we talk about it all the time. It has a lot of different terms. Uh, a more common term is telehealth, um, but uh, they're all the same thing. And then uh, how many of you experienced a virtual visit since uh, March of uh, 2020? Yeah, quite a few of us. Um, think about being at the other end as a physician, going from a Friday where I saw 15 children in my clinic face to face, uh, little, you know, little kids and, and their moms and dads. And the following Monday, I did 15 telephone calls and we called that telehealth. Uh, not very satisfying as a uh, physician, believe me. Um, so, uh, and many of our telehealth visits where the intention was to see the patient as a pediatrician, I would, you know, rev up the system and establish the video link and there would be a mom or a dad there and I'd say, well, where's little Johnny? Well, he's next door playing with his friends. And so it turned into just a Skype call with the parents. So again, not, not very satisfying. So uh, this two-way uh, audiovisual communication is only as good as the participants that come, come, to the, come to the show. Then we have remote patient monitoring and that's becoming more and more prevalent you know, we have our, I have the dumb watch. This is just a Timex. It tells me what time it is. Uh, but with our smart watches, our cell phones, all of the technology that's available for use in the home, um, we're, we're starting to use more and more digital tools and somehow getting that to the healthcare practitioner. I'm going to stop right here and tell you one of the biggest challenges um, that individuals who are designing these sorts of devices. Well, the big, one big challenge is the regulatory system. Uh, you can't just go out and make something and start assessing patients without working your way through the FDA, uh, for sure. And so, and the other is, even if you do that, the electronic medical record is here to stay. We, at Carilion Clinic, we use Epic and for your device or any gadget you come up with or app you come up with has to be able to talk to Epic. And you can't say, the doctor just has to go to the website and get the data. We don't do that, okay? It's gotta, I don't want data, I want actionable information and it has to hit my desktop. Um, some of my students have been frustrated with just communicating with physicians on projects, I say, I send him an email. And I said, think about this guy who's there seeing dozens of patients every day, having to type all that information in, and he's getting stuff from within the system from nurses and other physicians and labs and x-rays and all that. They don't have time to look at email. I, you know, when I was practicing, I might've looked at my official email once a week. So, we have to think about how all this stuff is communicated as you're developing this as well. So uh, what can we do with virtual visits now? Well, we can do a history and a review of systems and get some vital signs and kind of uh, see the patient. Uh, I did a, I wanted to get some images for this particular slide and I did a Google search and just put in uh, telemedicine images. And these are ones that I copied. Do you notice anything about these images that I pulled? Yeah, they're all, they look like most of them are urban, white females in really nice spaces, okay? But think about who we wanna reach when we start talking about reaching the underserved. Is that the demographic that we should really be looking at and thinking about? I don't think so. So, you know, one of the first things we do is we do what's called a review of system. So you kind of go from head to toe and ask all these questions, you know, about generally fatigue, fever, you know, eyes, ears, nose, throat, do you have a cough, wheezing, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's check boxes. Again, think about the populations that we're thinking about serving do they speak English? 
can they read? You know, I haven't seen anything out there. You know, we, we get all these uh, messages from the bank and other places where it will give you a prompt and you can give a verbal response that uh, prompts more questions. So verbal prompts with voice recognition for um, telemedical healthcare is just another thing I've not seen in the market. It might be there, I just haven't found it. Uh, and then the basic vital signs. You know, so somebody's at home and you can say, oh, get the temperature, get the pulse rate, get the respiratory rate, get a blood pressure. And the fifth vital sign now is the oxygen saturation. We focused a lot on that. Uh, when I called up Ross, my primary care the other week, he said, what's your oxygen saturation? I went, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have one of these one of these things. I used to have a pulse oximeter in the garage, but I think it's in my office now because some students need it. But uh, so putting all these things together in usable devices. Uh, the visual inspection, you know, the camera, it's only as good as whatever technology is in the home. And the ultimate remote patient encounter, which I've been working on, um, has been having some sort of a, a cart at the bedside that has all the tools I need in order to do a pretty thorough um, physical examination. So with the carts that we have, I can look in the eyes, the ears, the nose, the throat, listen to the chest, uh, look at the skin, look at how someone is walking, you know, getting a pretty good idea about a lot of stuff. The only thing I can't do is lay hands on the patient. You know, I can't feel liver and a spleen and feel their belly and see if they have any pain and things like that. But we're getting pretty good with this, but it's still kind of clunky. And then uh, when we talk about the rural population here in Southwest Virginia, um, you know, 5G will get here someday. That's going to be uh, transformational in some communities, but even where I live in Southwest Roanoke County, there is a dead zone. My Verizon just drops. <laughs> you must live in one of those two or close to it. So even in the best of situations, even with the 5G, we have problems. Uh, Starlink provided uh, internet uh, to uh, students in uh, uh, Wise County during COVID. So there, there are other technologies that are coming on board that can help us with uh, gaining and maintaining this connectivity. Um, but uh, I was talking with a group the other day and we arrived at the uh, kind of the statement, instead of bringing patients to the clinic, we need to bring the clinic to patients. And um, so when I talk about uh, global health, we talk about a community wellness uh, model of healthcare. Screen for disease, diagnose disease, treat disease, prevent disease. It's a really simplistic model, but it works very well when you're looking at healthcare. And, um, and then just taking those different stages, screening, non-intrusive devices that are located in the home. Can I put something in my 95-year-old mom's home that could just monitor her heart rate, her respiratory rate, her weight, um, love it if we could do something so we can measure glucose without her sticking her finger. We're getting there. But non-intrusive monitoring that detects change. I don't care what happens minute to minute, hour to hour in general, unless she falls. But um, if she's sleeping at night and her respiratory rate is trending upward, that could be a sign that she's going into heart failure okay, or getting pneumonia or something like that. So there are things that we've worked on and I've worked with ID students in years gone by on a device to do just that in nursing homes. Um, diagnosis, devices and processes with just uh, greater attention to human factors and ergonomics, I'll show you that when I finish up, one that I think needs a lot of improvement. Wearable devices, okay, we have all these smart watches, you know, let's take advantage of all the things they can do now. 
you know, the Apple, there's an Apple Watch that is FDA cleared for uh, EKG now. That's pretty fantastic, and you know, in my, uh, my profession. And then um, prevention, education, 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 education. Educating patients about uh, pre prevent anything we can do to prevent them from getting sick. That is the most cost effective thing we can do in medicine is to prevent this stuff before it ever happens. Okay, so just kind of thinking about needs, um, patient-friendly home environments. Uh, we need to look at mobility. Um, when I started thinking about giving this talk, I thought about just taking a photograph of a step. When you're in a wheelchair or you just had your hip replaced like I had 11 months ago, um, a stair, one step, might as well be 20 if you can't get up that first step. And so being sensitive to these things, we talked about all, you know, wearing those suits and riding around the wheelchair, I would highly recommend if you're doing design, you spend some time in a wheelchair and look at the barriers. Pea-sized gravel is, uh, we, have, we have students in biomedical engineering actually developing a walker for um, a debilitated person so they can jog. And we're looking at shock absorbers and the right kind of tires and all the things it would take to go over not really, really rugged terrain, but just going off road a little bit uh, is a big challenge. Um, assistive technologies, you know, just helping people who have arthritis and Parkinson's and, and have had strokes and things like that. There are lots of things that can be done in the built environment uh, in addition to uh, wearables. Um, we want to allow people to age in place. Um, you know, we, um, we have a project we've worked on recently to help manage medications in the home. And for people uh, with uh, Alzheimer's, there are certain stages where if we can help them with some of these things that seem so simple, they can stay in the home longer without having to go into a facility. Um, and then again, wearables is where it's at right now. Um, all these technologies and processes in our environment can be repurposed for affordable use in low and middle income countries. The image I have up there on the right, uh, I took straight from uh, an experience I had working with a community health worker in the slums of Nairobi. And so uh, they had an open source electronic medical record that he could enter his data into and upload it for a physician to look at and give him directions. And he walked into these huts with this little kit that had all the things uh, that he was trained to use to gather information and do a physical exam. Um, so again, the same solutions we create for rural USA are applicable in rural Malawi, where I've been working. And as Martha mentioned, I was one of the co-founders of Team Malawi, Technology, Education, Advocacy, and Medicine, uh, which is a transdisciplinary collaboration based on this community wellness model uh, designed to meet the challenges of resource-limited environments through community-based participatory research, design, and the educators made me put in pedagogy, but uh, I'm more focused, <laughs> more focused on research and design. And um, we, uh, we formed this group so that we could bring people together. Uh, you know, by the way, I'm not an engineer. I do not have a degree in engineering, but I'm a professor of practice in engineering because I started working with engineers as an undergraduate here at Virginia Tech. Martha failed to mention that. I, I did my undergraduate and graduate work at Virginia Tech before I ran off to medical school. And uh, most of my undergrad years and for my graduate degree, I worked with a biomedical engineer. So that's, that's what launched me uh, to do the things we do. So, you know, we, um, you know, we have goals, student engagement, student engagement, student engagement, um, international experiences and sustainable activities. Uh, and encouraging students to present and publish their work. It will come back when you're applying for a job. You, you wanna see you that? See okay, <laughs> so think about that. And don't forget, today is Veterans Day. 
So don't forget, you know, thank a vet. And I was really uh, proud to serve uh, with a lot of other physicians and engineers and military police and all the people I worked with uh, uh, years and years ago. And I like this picture because I'm right there with my, my medics building stuff, okay? So thank you. We're just going to get the lights on up here and invite our guests to the front and then um, take questions from the audience. Oh. While we're doing that, I forgot the one thing. I, I'm just going to show you right now. This is a clunky device that um, Carillion Clinic is using because it's the best they've got right now. Here, show it. If you can see it on that screen, then the people on, the, on Zoom can see it. Okay. This is a little device that they want to hand out to uh, parents to, uh, if their child is sick, they can connect and it has a little screen on it. And this is, this is the thing to look in ears. Now, just think about this for a second. Um, if uh, I went at one of my kids <laughs> when they were little with this sharp object and being a pediatrician, this is not easy to hold and look in an ear. And it actually takes two people to restrain and examine a combative two-year-old, trust me. Um, and then, if that's not bad enough, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask a parent to take this device and stick it in their kid's mouth. A <laughs> lot of work, but this is it. This, this is state of the art right now. And there is somebody out here who I think can do a better job than this. And, and, but this, this is what we have. And um, looking in the ears is an art. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm not sure how successful they've been with that. So that was. That was my little show and tell of the day. Keith, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, there was a brief mention uh, about open source medical software. And I was kind of curious about that. You know, uh, is the fact that medical software, that this medical software is open source, like did it help the work, the work that, was, that was being done? Is the open source movement coming to like medical software like a, a net benefit? for the medical practice, I'm curious about that. A absolutely, uh, you know, to, you know, the, the big companies that make the, the software that we use um, have invested probably now billions. Uh, I've always contended that our taxpayer dollars developed one of the first pretty good electronic uh, health uh, system for the military and the VA. And, um, you know, GE and Epic and some of these other folks, you know, just would fight tooth and nail to not allow that to just go. You know, why not? Why not have one really good, robust electronic medical record <coughs> system for the entire country? Uh, when I practiced in Roanoke, we had the Carillion Health, uh, Carillion Clinic, and then we had the Lewis Gale. Uh, you know, that's the HCA hospital system, and I could have a patient that came from an office there, and their medical record doesn't talk to my record, okay? And if I needed to look at an x-ray that was done at Montgomery Regional, uh, I had to jump through all kinds of hoops to get permission to look at that x-ray because it was in a different system. So there, there, are attempt, there have been attempts to integrate them. So in the U.S., we're paying for this. You, you know, when you're you're being charged to go to the doctor, part of the part of that charge is to maintain the electronic health record. In you know rural sub-Saharan Africa, um, it can be incredibly helpful. And so there are these open source uh, electronic health records. They they're being developed to to uh, be secure and have encryption and everything that we need to protect the privacy of the patients. But I think it's really, it's really been helpful and there's more and more being published about these electronic records. But the reality, when I travel to Malawi, 
Uh, I walk in a hospital. Electricity is an issue. It's not always, you, know, you flip the switch, the lights don't always come on. And if you're, if you're running a, uh, a network, your, your Wi-Fi doesn't work if you don't have electricity. And, uh, and then just the cost of the technology. You know, the cost, of, you know, in, in Malawi, I'm just using Malawi because I'm the most familiar there. The average person in Malawi lives on a dollar a day. So think about that in terms of having a smartphone or a tablet, a laptop, and I'm thinking of systems where there are hospitals I've been in, they can't afford the fuel to run a generator or to send an ambulance because they don't have the, they don't have the resources. So we, we work on these things, but we have to think about the environments that we're designing for and deploying into. So for the devices, I've worked with students in, in ID, in biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, um, we design things that will operate on batteries that are rechargeable because we don't want to be throwing batteries away. There have been lots of studies showing the hundreds of thousands of alkaline batteries that are in the ground in Africa right now. Um, so, and then we can use solar, we can use wind, we can use other um, uh, sources of electricity other than fossil fuels. I was wondering if I could take a little bit of what you said, um, Andy, and ask our two other panelists about access. So, you know, as we as we uh, live on a really beautiful Virginia Tech campus, right, we have access to a lot of things here. We have our own little mini city. I wonder, Naomi or Kim, how, how you've seen this um, play out in your own field or if you're if you have curiosities about what it means to have access coming from a different socioeconomic group or of remote locations, um, that disability is also an access issue. And so I just wonder if each one of you could comment on accessibility as an issue in your design work. Sure. Naomi, do you want to go ahead? Okay, so, go first. Okay. Well, you know, for me, I look at things always from an ABA um, environment and how we're having access. As I was coming up your stairs, your stairs are just a little tall. <laughs> There's a little uh, riser there. There's a riser there. Uh, that's kind of 1967. 19, yeah, I was going to say 1970 uh, uh, riser there. But uh, so code, you know, issues will always help with that. I, I, I did park in the Perry Street garage, so coming across the, the construction, <laughs> yeah. a lot of times I end up causing, you know, you kind of like, wow, okay, here we go, we'll go around here, and it's, it's all interesting, and you kind of do, you do think about that, you know, how, how you would be doing this in a wheelchair, how would, you know, I found myself on the wrong side of the barrier, it's like, whoops, <laughs> I knew better, I was like, oh, let me go get my hard hat and run back over here, but you do think about how you could, navigate this in a wheelchair, on a walker, um, it, it's definitely a challenge in a lot of places, uh, especially when you throw curveballs for construction and other alternate pathways. Um, it's just the things, things we notice. And I think as, as we keep building buildings and particularly, you know, medical facilities where stairs are issues, we, we do look at ramping and uh, other options, you know, obviously, the elevator is there, and we don't we don't try to do the, the do the base stairs, but there's all kinds of things coming into that play. I, I, I did I, I would just take one quick little segue though. I did I found your your part interesting there when you're talking about Haiti uh, or, uh, and the the power. So we've done some hospitals in Haiti, and they've done some very interesting things, and they put solar on the roofs. The solar lasted for about three days and they were ripped down and put on the black market very quickly. Oh. So you, there's, a lot, there's a lot to consider, that things that you don't see coming, and maybe it's a new lock on solars, you know, new solar panels that you're gonna design. Um, they're all kinds of interesting things. But. That, that's interesting because our Engineers Without Borders chapter here yeah. at Virginia Tech four or five years ago went to um, Uganda and installed a solar uh, system for, right. for a school, right. as I recall, and they had to figure out how to lock up yep. the batteries. Yep. <laughs> Otherwise, yep. they would disappear. <laughs> and, and our experience in Malawi, in terms of just 
before cell phones were ubiquitous, they didn't have telephone service. And everybody went, well, why not? It's because every time they would string up the copper, to, uh, they rip it down. Uh, yeah. People would tear it down and sell it. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just. Um, it's the way of life. I think that happens in South America when we visited Ecuador. The company we visited had the same problem. Every time they wire a phone to their business, their place of business, it would get immediately ripped down for the copper. Yeah. Well, when my wife is also a physician. She started working in Malawi in 2004. And to get the, she wanted to use a port, you know, handheld pulse oximeter, but she had to go to the hospital administrator who took the batteries out of his safe and, and oh. made her sign a sheet signing signing the batteries out because of the problems with theft because of, it's a valuable commodity. When uh, Naomi, when you were um, uh, when you were talking. Kim, when you were talking, I, I jotted down a couple of comments and, and looking at the hospital environment and looking at the environment here at Virginia Tech. Okay, I worked in a physician's office, worked in the hospital, you come out of the hospital and there's the concrete block house called the parking deck. And between the hospital or my office above Buffalo Wild Wings and the parking deck, it's not very friendly. Just in terms of decompressing, just that, that short period of time between your office and when you're getting in the car and get home. I live in Roanoke County, so I got a little bit of a drive, but, but there's no opportunity to decompress. And um, I, um, I'm pretty open about stuff. I had, I had colon cancer when I was 40 years old. and did 15 months of chemotherapy at the uh, Carilion Clinic Cancer Center. Um, not very, <laughs> it's old. It's old. And having an aquarium in the waiting room is just not very helpful. You know, <laughs> I spent about two minutes in the waiting room and then I was in this sterile environment for hours on end with nothing. They've done things, you know, they have the music and a little bit of the lights. But one of the, the most uh, therapeutic experiences I had during 15 months of chemotherapy is I walked out of the cancer center late one fall afternoon. It just happened that my car was where I had to face to the west. And the sky was blue, the sun was low on the horizon, the mountains, all the fall foliage was changing and that was one of the most soothing things of the whole experience I had. I mean it's so memorable. I, you know, I had cancer in 1993 so I obviously survived but uh, they beat me up pretty good for 15 months and so this envi the environmental impact on our daily lives uh, is so important and it's just I think it, it just gets magnified um, when you're in a healthcare environment. Can I jump in? Yeah. But I'll agree with that. <laughs> and that's a great, can you hear me? Yes. yes. And that's a great story. And, you know, I think one of the, the things that I love about teaching landscape architecture is providing access to nature, it's such a no brainer, right? Because Nature provides all of these other ecosystem services that are good not just for people, but the planet. And so it ends up being a win-win-win. So yes, if you provide trees, then it helps people when they're recovering or going through chemotherapy. It also helps other people who are going to work or studying for a test. Um, it also helps birds who need a place to nest and insects to eat. It helps lower um, the heat island effect and it helps filter the air. So, you know, trees and other greenery, um, they just, they do so much. And it's fun with my students getting to explore all of these different ways that the environment um, or the ways that we design the environment can be beneficial to humans while at the same time, if they're designed well, um, be beneficial to non-human species and non-living things as well. 
And I wanted to just tell you a quick story. Um, Andre, you were talking about uh, remote sensing devices. I was at a mental health conference at Cornell and one of the women who's a nurse, she said, if I just had a toilet that would measure when my patients got urinary tract infections, I would give a million dollars. <laughs> because there were so people with, with urinary, especially women with urinary tract infections, there were distinct behavior changes, but that would happen after the infection had already started. And she said, if we could just catch it right when it started, then there would be so many fewer behavior changes and, and time wasted and lives made better. That's interesting. A solution that we looked at was um, uh, for, for, the, for the elderly to age in place was to place a low profile um, scale in the bathroom because everybody goes there eventually. And so snagging their weight on a daily basis, looking for any changes which can indicate, uh, you know, in the long term that they're not, uh, their nutrition is, is not adequate. But in the short term, especially for people at risk for heart failure, you retain fluid, you can gain a lot of weight very quickly. But also with that same scale, we talked about using it as a center, sensor and looking at patterns, looking at activities of daily living, sleeping, how long are you spending in the bed? That can be measured very easily. How many times are you going to that toilet and one of the early signs of urinary tract infections is frequency of urination. So if you're kind of running back and forth and outside of your norm, then somebody gets an alert. So I think that, um, and the other thing is in the elderly, urinary tract infections not only is infection, but many of them it changes their mental status incredibly fast. And you just hear that over and over, and I've experienced that with aging parents and parents of friends is, is just the change in mentation with a simple urinary tract infection. So I think it's, uh, you know, these are the things that as designers, if you learn about and understand, and the best way to do that is to get out there and talk to people. Um, and there are plenty of folks out there that are interested in talking about this. Well, I'll, I'll add on to that conversation since we're talking about uh, urinary tract infections. We, we, one of the things from a plumbing engineering side of the house is that there you can even monitor your, your water use in a building. Uh, it, this is a product that's already that's newly on the market, I'd say within the last so maybe five years. Um, but you get many benefits by measuring someone's uh, use of water in their building. You kind of get a baseline, you know about what they're going to use, doing dishes, going to the bathroom, that type of thing. But what you also get on the elderly is when they stop using water, maybe they fall, maybe they are deceased, you get alarms that'll come off. And so there's a lot of how you, our daily habits affect, you know, we can monitor those things again. It's all about connection. <laughs> And it's not using video. Yeah, I think that's one, right. of, the, one of the issues that comes yeah. up over and over. Nobody wants Big Brother looking at them with a camera. Right. But if you have sensing devices that you can't really see, but they're doing their job in the background and alerting somebody if the norm, if you get outside the norm. Right. Uh, I think that's these are these are the things that you know. How do you design that into everyday household? devices. How do you integrate some of that stuff with everyday household devices? We'd even talked about having alerts, kind of the early alerts. Could we work with the cable company so that, uh, you know, at my mom's house when her phone rings, she's got the Cox network thing, the thing comes up on her TV screen, you're getting a call from such and such. Well, if, if we could set up an alert system where she got a call coming through the same system saying, I see that you're, uh, you know, maybe going to the bathroom more frequently. Are you feeling okay? Or you know, something that could alert the person to kind of reflect on what's going on, but then it could escalate you know, to a neighbor, a family member, nine one one. Or maybe it's just yeah. a water leak. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's just a forgot, water leak. Forgot to right. turn the water off. Right. 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 <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. Naomi, uh, I, I, was, I was really inspired by your talk. And I'll just mention an interesting thing that happened about landscape gardens. Um, 20, 25 years ago, a, came in, a woman came from Germany, and she gave a class on the history of garden design. And, and I sat in on it, and I was, I was blown away. And she talked about all the great landscape architects. She talked about Frederick Law Olmsted and the beginning of the Park Service and all that stuff. And I realized, and, and then it was really interesting. I talked to a number of people in, in landscape that aren't here anymore. And they told me, oh, garden design is for spoiled people. It's just frou-frou. <laughs> it's just looks. You know, it's not real, it's not something that will help the poor. So why don't you just forget that and focus on important stuff? And then what I see, beautiful gardens for health, for human yeah. health. You know, and, and I, I see the relationship between the things you say and what Olmsted said. But yeah. I see uh, scientific reasons why beautiful gardens are important. And yeah. they're not fruitful. They're and not that, just the icing on the cake. That's it, you know? And it was so and, exciting to hear. So so thank you very much. And they really are, and they worked fine on me, and there's nothing wrong with me that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, Olmsted was the commissioner of the, I think it was the Sanitary Health Commission. He was the head of that, which was the precursor to the American Red Cross. Yeah. And he had worked with sick people in the military before he became a landscape architect. So he really, the reason that he was so interested in parks, especially urban parks, where he talked about them as the lungs of the city and how they were, you know, these democratic spaces that would enable everyone to have clean air and access to nature. Didn't matter what color you were, what religion, what age, what size, it was free for everyone. So he was, ahead of his time and still someone to to laud well we've we've gotten to the end of our time so i definitely want to invite any of the students who are in the room that would like to ask questions or our panelists to please stick around um, some of these folks with our students are going to you know maybe provide desk crits in the future um, dr buenaire works with us in our needs identification course so there's ways that you can continue to stay involved with this topic not just coming today so I want to thank you for your time, students and faculty. Thank you to our panelists, Naomi, Kim, and Andy. We really appreciate your time and effort today. Um, and I hope everyone may do well. Thank you.